So today we're going to talk about the transition from the first Roman imperial dynasty, which was the Julio-Claudian dynasty of Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero, to the second dynasty. This is the Flavian dynasty of Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. The story of the Julio-Claudian transition to the Flavians is, on one level, one of imperial failure, uh, suicide, and civil war. But on the other hand, it's also a story of this transition between different ways of running the Roman state and this process of incorporating new people. Uh, Because on one level, the uh, Flavian dynasty represents an incorporation of, in a sense, that new elite uh, that Augustus had particularly favored in building out the early Julio-Claudian Senate and administrative structure. Uh, This is the moment when that new elite rises to the level of imperial power. But it's also in some ways precipitated by a failure by the last Julio-Claudian emperor, the Emperor Nero, to truly understand the tolerance that the Roman state had and that Romans had for an accelerated process of reaching out and including new people from beyond the Italian and Gallic and Spanish core. Now, the, uh, the way to start that discussion is to look again at the Tablet of Lyon. Now, in the last lecture, we looked at the Tablet of Lyon and talked about this as, a, as an aspect of a policy that the Emperor Claudius puts in place that is a successful policy. It's a successful policy that looks at the uh, considerable number of people in Gaul who have something to offer the Roman state at the highest levels. And despite questions from the Senate, uh, it's a policy that the Emperor Claudius pushes through. And uh, for the most part, this is a good thing for Rome. Um, And Claudius, in making this case, is able to appeal back to the earliest Roman traditions of people like Servius Tullius, this Roman tradition of seeing where the skills of the people living in the Roman territory actually reside, and coming up with ways to incorporate the most talented and most skillful people at the highest levels of the Roman state. And so the Tablet of Beyond reflects a success, but it also reflects a level of resistance. Um, Because Claudius does this, and it is a successful reform, but it's also not universally popular. It's something that uh, generally also reflects concerns among the people who were in a position of power uh, about sharing those powers with other people who were outside of that elite circle, but in terms of their financial um, wherewithal, uh, their connections, and their reach, they were in some ways more influential than the people currently in the Senate. This is a traditional story of Roman power dynamics. Um, It's the story at the beginning of the Republic, when uh, patricians refused or didn't wish to share authority and power with wealthy plebeians. It's the story during the conflict of the orders, when Plebeians try to open up the consulship to plebeian memberships, and and the senators who are uh, patricians resist this. Uh, It's also, of course, the story of Julius Caesar and Augustus and their efforts to bring a new Roman aristocracy into the highest levels of power to build up support for their new regimes. This is always a Roman story. And it's a Roman story where the strategy of inclusion and the resistance of those who are already at the top plays out and plays against each other. Um, But the emperors understood that a stagnant ruling class was not good for them. Claudius' extension of senatorial membership to people in central Gaul is important because it represents an emperor understanding that his power remains secure only if he is continually integrating the strongest and richest of his citizens at that highest level of the Roman state just below imperial power. And to be blunt, a failure to incorporate leading Gallic figures into the Senate a hundred years after Caesar conquered their home region would likely endanger Roman control of Gaul in much the same way that the failure to incorporate leading Italians into the Roman Republic in the 90s BC sparked the Social War. And so the Julio-Claudian dynasty, and particularly um, the the regime of Claudius, shows that there is a way to do these things. Um, A successful emperor is able to continually expand his base of influential supporters by finding people who are, are strong, rich, and powerful in their home regions who can be brought into the imperial power structure in a fashion that makes them supportive of the emperor. 
but this always has to be done in such a way that it balances the advantages he gains from getting new people into that higher level power structure and uh, manages to offset the concerns of the entrenched aristocracy and the entrenched elite about sharing their power with new people who come um, with potentially more influence and more resources than the people already in the highest levels of the hierarchy. Now, ultimately, the Julio-Claudian dynasty would come apart because Nero, its final emperor, found himself unable to execute the delicate task of allowing Romans to feel that they continue to participate meaningfully in their political life while also extending opportunities to others and articulating a way of reigning that uh, illustrated influence in a fashion that was understood by all of the people in the empire, not just Italians. Um, and Nero's problems ultimately grew out of both a set of misjudgments about what the empire was willing to take in terms of the expansion of influential ranks uh, of senators and others, and a basic set of behaviors that Nero didn't understand would bother those elite Rome, these elite Romans. And so he compounded his own problems in a sense. And his failures forced Rome to confront the end of its first imperial dynasty and its first civil war in a century. <clears throat> But Nero is a wonderful study in the contrast between the image presented by the emperor himself, the image presented by our senatorial historians, and the image received by people in Roman provinces. So Nero took power in 54 AD at the age of 16. Um, he was the adopted son of the emperor Claudius. The power sharing, again, was not contested. It was clear that Claudius was willing to do this um, and was positioning Nero for this uh, this place as successor. Um, it is a bit controversial because there were rumors, at least in Rome, that Nero's mother had poisoned Claudius so that Nero could take over. But what we see in these images of young Nero is a very conventionally defined uh, public image of Nero as a Julio-Claudian emperor. And um, for most of the first five years of his reign, uh, Nero actually worked as a kind of cipher for the senatorial philosopher Seneca. <clears throat> Seneca was supposed to be Nero's tutor and his mentor, and for a time he exercised a great deal of control over the policies that Nero followed. But between 59 and 62 AD, Nero began to move away from the influence of Seneca. Seneca was first sent into retirement, and then Nero began to change his policies and his image. So we see this reflected in Nero's portraits. These are or early Neronian portraits, um, and you can see that this is a set of portraiture that's designed to echo the portraiture of Augustus. And one of the clear giveaways of this is when you look at the hair. Um, if you look at the top of Nero's hair, you see in the very center above his nose, sort of the second layer of hair, you see this kind of lobster claw um, where the hair kind of divides like a, like a lobster claw. Um, this is a, a typical hairstyle of the Emperor Augustus. And so this, is, this can be seen as, and you can see on this um, image of Augustus, you can see the lobster claw hairstyle, again, right above his nose. <clears throat> this is something that is done quite deliberately. Nero is made to look like Augustus because you're seeing an effort to make Nero's portraiture emphasize his connections with the Julio-Claudian dynasty. But as we get into the later 60s, so after about 63, 64 AD, Nero's portraiture changes. It stops being recognizably Julio-Claudian and instead becomes something that is very distinctive. Um, this is a portrait of Nero, it's possibly recarved. You can see the, the way the hair is done. Um, it's not normal for human hair to do that. So this may well be a recarved portrait, say, of Caligula. Um, but these are what late portraits of Nero looks like, look like. You can see the uh, move away from those Julio-Claudian features. You can see the move towards emphasizing his, um, well, uh, his overweightness. Uh, you could see the facial hair, which was not part of Julio-Claudian portraiture. Um, you can also see that those nice clean lines that defined Neronian portraiture here the nose uh, and the clean lines along the eye, the eyebrows, those are gone. Um, what you have instead is a face that is, um, well, maybe not natural, but a face that looks quite different. 
The nose is different. The eyes, the way the eyes are presented are different. This is a distinctive portraiture. Um, and the change in the portraiture is something that also is reflected in the way ancient sources describe Nero's life at that time. <clears throat> ancient sources describe Nero descending into a life of kind of complete indulgence. Uh, and so the overweightness is something that's supposed to be um, identifiable with that decline into indulgence. The stories, are, the stories that are told are that Nero spends large, mon large amounts of money on luxury and entertainment. <clears throat> and then when he ran out of money, he charged wealthy people with crimes, had them executed and confiscated their wealth. And the reason it was said was to finance his pleasures. By 64 AD, things got much worse for Nero. And this is because Nero <clears throat> had begun work on a large palace complex in an area of the Forum that, um, a, that caused Nero to move out from the relatively economical and small accommodations that were favored by Augustus and Tiberius. One of the things that Augustus had done was um, to allude or give the illusion that he remained equal to senators in everything but the authority he ex exercised by living in a nice but not overly grandiose house on the Palatine Hill. But as Nero was pivoting to a different way of ruling, Nero also came to believe that a Roman emperor needed to have actually a residence that befit someone who was a Roman emperor. <clears throat> and so it should not be just another senatorial residence. It should be a palace complex, <clears throat> a palace complex that resembled those that were uh, exercised and used by sovereigns across the Mediterranean. Now the building of the Domus Transitoria, so as it was called, was progressing when a large fire swept through Rome in 64 AD. Uh, this is the fire that famously Nero is blamed for and the story of Nero fiddling while Rome burns, it concerns this fire. Now, um, Nero was blamed for this probably unfairly. Fires were a major problem in Rome. Rome was an overcrowded city with largely wooden construction <clears throat> that was many stories tall. Um, people would burn fires in their apartment buildings. The apartment buildings were dense uh, and fire could jump from one to the other quite easily. So this fire in 64 was not Nero's fault, but people believed it was. Uh, and Nero made a series of choices after the fire that really exacerbated the problems that Nero had. Um, one of them was to use the clearing out of the space between the, the Palatine and the Caelian Hills as an excuse to build a giant palace on the land that had once been public land and housing. <clears throat> this was something that was called the Domus Aurea, and here you can see just a small part of what's left of the Domus Aurea. The Domus Aurea is, a, is actually a space that you can still visit, but um, it now exists under the baths of the Emperor Trajan, and so this is why the, the plan is as it is. Um, now, the Domus Aurea complex was something that was decorated with gardens, a giant lake, and a colossal statue of Nero. And it was also magnificently big. So on the right, you see an image of what the Domus Aurea, what some of the remains of the Domus Aurea now look like. Suetonius describes it this way. He says, the following details will give some notion of its size and magnificence. The entrance hall was large enough to contain a huge statue of Nero that was 120 feet high. And the pillared arcade ran for a whole mile. An enormous pool like a sea was surrounded by buildings made to resemble cities and by a landscape garden consists of plowed fields, vineyards, pastures, and woodlands. All the dining rooms had ceilings of fretted ivory, the panels of which could slide back and let a rain of flowers or perfume from hidden sprinklers shower upon the guest. Um, the interior that we see actually is quite suggestive of the luxury of this space. Um, so here's just a hallway in the Domus Aurea. You can see both how large it is and then how um, incredibly thoroughly decorated it is. The main dining room, uh, and this well may well be the main dining room, the main dining room was circular and its roof revolved day and night in time with the sky. Seawater and sulfur water was always on tap in the baths. When the palace had been decorated throughout in this style, Nero dedicated it and condescended to remark, good, now I can at least at last live like a human being. 
<clears throat> now, the implication in this is that Nero has lost that connection with the Roman past and with other Roman citizens that represented that fundamental linkage um, that made the Republic of the Emperors, the Republic of the early emperors like Augustus and Tiberius, actually function. Because Romans, again, had always been comfortable delegating actual decision-making out to other people. Even in the height of the Roman Republic, every Roman citizen understood that the authority that they possessed as a citizen would be delegated through elections and other choices to people who would make decisions on their part. What Nero is doing, though, here is he's beginning to break that connection between the emperor and his fellow citizens. What he's creating instead is an impression that the emperor is in charge and he has subjects, not fellow citizens. And so Suetonius is speaking to the fact that Nero has lost that tie that joined the emperor with his fellow citizens. And that tie is actually really important in a structure like the, um, the Roman Empire. But Suetonius goes on, he says, Nero believed that fortunes were made to be squandered, and whoever could account for every penny he spent seemed to Nero a stingy miser. True gentlemen, he said, always throw their money around, and he even professed great admiration for his uncle Gaius, this is Caligula, who had run through the vast fortune that Tiberius had left him. So the vast fortune that Tiberius left him, of course, when we, we looked last time at Suetonius' Caligula, we see where First of all, Suetonius is referring back to his biography of Caligula there, but also we saw that Suetonius's criticism of Caligula for spending that money was disingenuous. Uh, a lot of the money that Caligula spent was on policy. Um, it was not on addiction to luxury. It was through things like tax breaks and um, refunds to people who had lost revenue because of disasters or other things. So we should be suspicious of this to some degree. But the Domus Aurea does show us that Nero did have a particularly uh, developed t sense of and taste for elaborate ways of living. <clears throat> now, um, the distance that Nero then is creating between himself and senators and himself and other Roman citizens is deliberate. It's a break from precedent. Um, it is a way of creating a different model for how imperial power should be exercised. And this is potentially problematic because of how Romans believe the emperor ought to function. But the real challenge was whether Nero was acting like the empire was his personal possession or whether he still was remaining true to the idea of the republic, the idea that the state is something that belongs to everyone. And authority over it is delegated by those people to individuals, but it is fundamentally not the property of an individual. And so as time progressed, it became clearer and clearer that Nero was at least, in the very least, behaving in a way that was detrimental to people's continuing understanding that Nero appreciated he was just a fellow citizen who exceeded other Romans in authority, but not in any sort of tangible um, and material way. <clears throat> so, one of the ways that this happened is on the, um, the grounds of the Domus Aurea, Nero erected a colossal statue of the sun god. Uh, and this was a, a statue that, um, the statue base still survives. This is the statue base that's outside the Colosseum now. Uh, this was something that was seen as uh, grandiose and a way of glorifying Nero's own um, public impression. But other things that Nero did also uh, troubled people to some degree. So Nero sang poetry in public and competed in competitions um, in the Greek world. So uh, we're told, for example, that Nero drove a chariot in many places, and at Olympia he drove a ten-horse team, even though in one of his own poems he'd criticized Mithridates for just that thing. But after he'd been thrown from the car and put back in, he was unable to hold out and gave up before the end of the course, but he received the crown just the same. And on his departure, Nero presented the entire province of Achaea with freedom, and at the same time gave the judges Roman citizenship and a large sum of money. These favors he announced in person on the day of the Ithmian Games, standing in the middle of the stadium. So there's a couple things that Nero is doing here. Now, on the right, what we see is the house of Nero. 
Um, so we know that Nero went to Olympia. We know that this story is real. Uh, this house of Olympia actually has a water pipe that is inscribed with Nero Og, Nero Augustus. This is clearly a house of Nero at Olympia. And we also then can accept that Nero drove chariots at Olympia. But what is important to see is when Nero wins the chariot race at Olympia, <clears throat> what we also see is that Nero is using this as an opportunity to appeal to and give grants to elite people in the Greek world to try to incorporate them further into the Roman state. This is why Roman citizenship is given. Um, this is the, the freedom is a complicated thing. It's not totally clear what Nero actually meant by this, but um, the scene is supposed to be evocative of what, Flam um, <clears throat> what Flamininus had done at the Isthmian Games in 196 BC when he proclaimed the freedom of Greece. Nero is is imitating uh, a Roman example that provides a, a kind of paradigm for how Greeks might function. It's not clear what freedom means, but it is clear what citizenship means. And Nero um, is here trying to do for the Greek world what Claudius was able to successfully do for the Gallic world. But Nero fails in this. Nero goes too far. I mean, the criticism that we see of this in Suetonius reflects a really, really intense Italian um, disquiet at the kind of behavior that Nero is, is undertaking in the Greek world. Because even though it's possible to see in Nero's outreach to Greek elites a, an attempt to do something like what Claudius had done, appeal to powerful interests that lived in the empire but were not yet fully included in the imperial infrastructure, Claudius's Gauls were seen as, in effect, Romanized barbarians. But Nero's Greeks were more problematic. <clears throat> Greeks had been under the control of Rome for longer than people in Gaul, but culturally they'd also proved much more resistant to the sorts of Romanization efforts that we saw in Gaul. So the men that, that Claudius brought into the Roman Senate are people from Gallic families who have, who have Latin names and have been speaking Latin for a very long time. They are people who integrate into this environment a lot more easily than uh, people who, in the Greek East, continue to speak Greek, continue to have Greek names, continue to emphasize some level of distinction from what is Roman. And going all the way back to Cato the Elder, Roman senators had been suspicious of Greek influence. And so the senatorial view of what Nero is doing is Nero is wasting money. He's doing things unbecoming of his dignity by competing in chariot races in Greece. Um, and this is generally seen as something that, that undermines the, uh, the position that Nero is trying to claim in Rome. But the other side is also interesting, because Nero seems to be genuinely popular in Greece and the Greek-speaking parts of the Eastern Mediterranean. <clears throat> He's so popular, in fact, that after Nero dies in 68 AD, fake Neros continue to pop up and try to take imperial power in the East for more than 20 years after Nero's death. And so Nero's outreach to the East is successful. Nero's ability to integrate these new people, these new powerful elites into the Roman state structure without overly upsetting people already in the Senate and already in the highest levels of the Roman state, that's what fails. <clears throat> and so that failure means that Nero was not able to build up a power base in the East that was sufficiently strong to prevent him from succumbing to the anger of the Senate, which was still overwhelmingly made up of Western people from Italy and surrounding provinces. And Nero reacted badly to this senatorial anger. Um, Nero put senators on trial. He's even said to have murdered his own mother. Now, it's possible that there's a more generous view of Nero. Um, I think that what we can see is someone who is very deliberately thinking about policies that allow him to pivot from the senatorial elite of people like Seneca <clears throat> to a broader imperial elite that he can then um, incorporate into a power structure that he can remake in a way that's much more favorable to his interests. Um, and not only that, not only is Nero kind of a visionary who's a little bit ahead of his time, um, but Nero also had some real achievements. So, for example, um, this is a coin of Nero with the closing of the doors of the Temple of Janus. It's a coin from 66, 66 AD, and the closing of the doors of the Temple of Janus reflect the, um, 
idea that the empire is truly at peace. And there are no major wars being raised, being raid, waged during that part of his reign. But in the end, this is not enough. Um, Nero dies in 68 after committing suicide when he heard of the revolt of one of his commanders. He is at this point um, barely 30 years old. And with him died the dynasty of Augustus. The person who replaced him is this guy. Um, this is a man named Galba. <clears throat> now, Galba was a commander in Spain, and uh, he marched his forces in order to aid a revolt against Nero that was taking place in Gaul. Um, but soon, Galba is proclaimed as emperor on his own. And after the after the the suicide of Ner of Nerva, I mean of Nero, um, Galba is in charge. Uh, and so this coin that's issued is one of the earliest coins issued by Galba. It's issued um, in the middle part of the year 68, right after his rebellion. And the legend is very interesting here. <clears throat> it says, Concordia Provincarum. This means the agreement or the concord of the provinces. And this is what Galba is advertising. Because it's a provincial governor who revolted against Nero. And what Galba is promising is an end to the division of the provinces against the central administration. What Galba does is he poses as a traditionalist, but uh, Galba's failures, which are, are significant and quick, come about because the traditionalist in Galba is not able to appeal to some of the elements in Rome that retain uh, affinity for what Nero had done, and particularly um, Galba is not able to appeal to and sustain the support of the Praetorian guards in Rome who should protect him. Um, and so Galba falls pretty quickly. And following in quick succession then are revolts by Otho, who is a Roman acquaintance of Nero, who has Galba killed in early 69. And then Vitellius. Um, and so Otho is on the left. Uh, and Otho is in some ways, one of the greatest Roman portraits ever, because you can see in the front of Otho's portrait, you can see that Otho is very clearly wearing a hairpiece. The front of his hair and the back of his hair do not match. Um, and so it's actually a really wonderful thing to see on Roman coins. Um, Otho is uh, then, Otho's revolt then prompts a rebellion by two other people, a man named Vitellius, who uh, comes down from Germany, and battled Otho until Otho committed suicide to avoid Roman troops from killing each other. And if you look at Vitellius, you can see uh, this is a figure who, again, um, had a bit of a weight problem. Vitellius is not a remarkable emperor for anything other than the fact that he was renowned as a gourmand. Um, and so Vitellius is known as the emperor who likes to eat. And Apicius, who wrote a Roman cookbook, mentioned some of the recipes, some of the most rich and um, enticing recipes were favorites of the Emperor Vitellius, uh, simply to imply that these must be really good because Vitellius knew his food and Vitellius was particularly fond of this. Now the process of rebellion that we see is uh, once Nero is unable to hold on to control of the empire, the structure that Augustus created with one significant figure in charge over this um, vast sort of infrastructure and vast hierarchy, uh, once that individual is gone, then that hierarchy breaks down into its pieces. And so this is why provincial governors who do not have the resources to challenge an emperor all on their own start challenging each other. This is also why Otho is able to take advantage of the fact that the Praetorian guards are the only army forces or the only military forces allowed in the city of Rome. Otho builds a power base by appealing to the Praetorian guards and overthrowing Galba that way. But what the death of Nero shows is that the structure that Augustus created, again, depends entirely on that one individual who stands atop it. And once Nero no longer was able to control this whole structure, it brought about anarchy. Uh, and this is why the year after the um, suicide of Nero is called the year of the four emperors. The year 69 saw four different people as Roman emperors. Galba, overthrown by Otho. Otho, defeated by Vitellius. Uh, but ultimately, the person who wins this is Vespasian. Um, now, Vespasian wins in large part because in that division of resources across different 
elements of the Roman state and the division of the army across different commanders across scattered across the Roman Empire, Vespasian had the largest and best troops in that division. And this is because Vespasian was a military commander in Syria who at the time of Nero's death was in the process of putting down the Jewish revolt that would culminate in the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem. <clears throat> and this, of course, put him in a good position to take charge of the state because his forces were the best trained, they were the most battle-tested, they understood how to conquer cities in a way that these other forces had less experience doing, and um, they were very loyal to him. And so the dynasty that Vespasian founds comes about because of Vespasian's victory over Vitellius. Uh, and it's a dynasty that's called the Flavian dynasty because his last name was Flavius. And they immediately begin to try and distinguish themselves from Nero's agenda. And they do this in a number of ways. One of the ways they do this is um, simply by changing the way they displayed imperial power. So if we look at late phase Nero, what we see is a figure who glorifies in his double chins and strange beards and uh, luxuries and devotion to creating as much private space in the Roman imperial context as is possible. Vespasian and Titus uh, emphasize a different aesthetic. Um, there is a an old way in Roman portraiture, going back to the Republic, of emphasizing a kind of senatorial virtue. Um, this is a portrait style that's called verism. And it is a portrait style that emphasizes the ugliness of the figure because ugliness in this context represents age and experience. And so you have a, uh, with Augustus, a pattern of um, de-emphasizing his aging so that the portraits of Augustus from when he's in his 70s still look like he's in his 30s. With Vespasian, what you have is a, a set of portraits that go back to this previous, um, prior to Augustus, way of displaying senatorial achievement, um, an emphasis on experience, an emphasis on age. And this is what Vespasian is doing. What's interesting is Vespasian is, is old enough that he might actually have had, you know, wrinkles and lines and signs of kind of aging, crow's feet and other things. Titus, not so much. Um, but what you see with Titus, again, is this, again, a, a kind of premature aging of Titus, uh, and it contrasts pretty significantly with Nero. The other thing that these guys do <clears throat> is they try to establish themselves as pro-senatorial in their policies and activities. So Vespasian and Titus are known for favoring philosophers and wealthy members of Roman society, in contrast to Nero, who is seen as um, disregarding the Senate, particularly after the murder of Seneca, and uh, also seen as hostile to philosophers, um, but eager to please people who were non-senators and people from the East in particular. The contrast in here is important because what it allows Vespasian to do is communicate that the uh, stresses that Nero's embrace of megalomania, Nero's embrace of um, these giant palaces, Nero's embrace of his own distinction from senators, um, Vespasian is able to say that that has ended. He's doing something that is traditional, something that's customary, something that's grounded in the way that the Republic is supposed to work, even if there still remains an emperor who's in charge. And so one thing that the Flavians are doing, the first um, phase of the Flavian dynasty is doing, is emphasizing a break with Nero. But the other thing they're doing is emphasizing continuity with the successful emperors that preceded them. And we can see this from a very interesting text. <clears throat> this is a text that's called the Lex de Imperio Vespasiani. And it's a text that actually lays out the sort of legal basis of the powers that Vespasian will exercise. It's not totally clear what, um, this is a law, but it's not totally clear whether this is a law that's put out by the Concilium Plebis, whether this is a law that's put out by the Senate. But basically what we see here is a text that lays out the legal basis for the authority that Vespasian is going to exercise. And um, what we see in this text is Vespasian emphasizing continuity with Augustus, Tiberius, and Claudius, the three successful Julio Claudian emperors, while he ignores the actions of the unsuccessful emperors Caligula, Nero, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius, even though Caligula, Nero, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius all shared these same powers. 
And in the laws that gave them these powers, they would have said effectively the same thing. But if we look at this, we can see how very deliberate this is, this emphasis on continuity with the successful emperors of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. So one selection. It shall be lawful for Vespasian to hold a session of the Senate, to make a motion in it, <clears throat> to refer a matter to it, to propose decrees of the Senate by a motion, and by calling for a vote by division, just as it was lawful for the deified Augustus, for Tiberius Julius Caesar Augustus, for Tiberius Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. So Augustus, Tiberius, and Claudius. Um, whatever Vespasian considers to be in accordance with the public advantage and the dignity of divine and human and public and private interest, he shall have the right and the power to do and to execute, execute just as had the deified Augustus and Tiberius Julius Caesar Augustus and Tiberius Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. Now that second part is very, very important because it ties back to the idea of the empire as a structure in which precedent matters. Because that precedent was, you know, again, if we go back to Cicero's idea of what a republic is, that precedent was agreed upon by the Roman citizen body as befitting what's lawful and beneficial to the commonwealth as a whole. And the word commonwealth in Cicero's structure is res publica. What we have here is a sort of checking back or a touching back to the basic fundamental uh, laws and allocations of power that ultimately the people give um, through their consent, the citizens give through their consent to Vespasian. This is again, that structure of emperor working in accordance with the rules and structures of the Republic. Uh, Another thing that the, the Flavians do is to turn away from this idea of Nero building a palace that was private space. And they do this very, um, very deliberately and very carefully, uh, because what they do is they abandon the Domus Aurea completely, and its grounds are converted. The artificial lake at the center of it, um, and so if you look here, the left obviously is the Colosseum, uh, just across the street from the Colosseum, you see that giant parkland with the, the sort of semicircle and the triangle. Uh, underneath that is the Domus Aurea. And so that's Nero's golden house. The Colosseum stands on the site of what was once Nero's artificial lake. And the Colosseum takes the name Colosseum from the giant statue of Nero, the Colossus of Nero, um, that stood outside of it. Now work on the Colosseum was begun, um, work on the Colosseum was begun under Vespasian, but it was completed by his son Titus. And Titus is seen as the best Flavian. He was um, very much beloved during his lifetime, but part of that has to do with the fact that um, his lifetime was not very long after he took power. Um, so Titus is the son of Vespasian. And following Vespasian's decision to march on Rome, Titus is the one who took over the uh, suppression of the Jewish revolt in Judea. And this is a good PR moment for him because he won the victory. He's the one who captured Jerusalem. And the victory was seen as confirmation that he was, in, he was a successful leader. And then um, in the first year of his father's reign, Titus came back to Rome and celebrated a great triumph. So here's Titus in his triumphal chariot, um, and then here's a slide of the spoils from the triumph. And of course, the menorah is the most notable of these. The uh, story of, of Titus's capture of Jerusalem was also something that was widely celebrated. So Suetonius says in the final assault on Jerusalem, Titus managed to kill 12 of the garrison with successive arrows. And the city was captured on his daughter's birthday. And Titus's powers inspired such deep admiration in the troops that they held him as imperator, and on several occasions, when he seemed on the point of relinquishing command, they urged him to stay on or let them go on with him. Now, um, the coin on the left is a very famous image, uh, Judea Capta. This is um, a representation, the, the woman bowing down. This is Judea, the personification of Judea, and she's been captured by the Romans. On the left is a victory trophy. Um, this idea of Judea capta, uh, the reduction of the rebels in Judea, 
This was a major selling point for the early stages of the Flavian dynasty because Vespasian and Titus had combined to do this. And so this is widely, widely celebrated, not just on these coins, but ultimately also on the Arch of Titus. But Titus, even though his soldiers may well have been willing to allow him to march on Rome and try to seize power from his father, <clears throat> he didn't. He served under his father loyally um, and then succeeded his father when Vespasian died in 79. And this brings us to one of the high points of Titus's reign, the dedication of the Colosseum. The Colosseum was finished in the year 80, and it was dedicated that year with a, mag a massive and magical, lavish uh, display. So the Colosseum could see 50,000 people. And on the moment of its dedication, Titus provided a most lavish gladiatorial show. He also staged a sea fight on the old artificial lake, and when the water had been let out, he used the basin for further gladiatorial shows and a wild beast hunt, 5,000 beasts of different sorts dying on a single day. So there's a couple of things that are significant about this. First of all, this was incredibly extravagant. It was very, very expensive. The construction of the Colosseum obviously is a huge expense to, um, you know, we know how much stadiums cost. And the Colosseum is the size of, it's bigger than most modern Major League Baseball stadiums. And it's the size of some of the smaller NFL stadiums. Um, it's huge. And it's expensive. But then to put on this show to open it, um, a show that ran for many, many days um, and involved many, many expensive entertainments, this also was a huge drain on the budget. But Titus was a new emperor. And we saw with Caligula, we also, you know, to a degree saw even with Galba, the expenses a new emperor assumed were much more significant than the emperor would have to absorb later on in his reign. Uh, and so what Titus is able to do is he does what other emperors do, but he has this massive, um, massive stage to display his munificence for the regular Roman population. And so he does. He spends a lot of money in very spectacular fashion to inaugurate the biggest and most impressive amphitheater in the entire Roman world. And then, not long after the games finish, Titus dies. And so I think we can understand why Titus, who reigns for, you know, barely two, uh, uh, less than two years, we can understand why Titus would be seen as one of the best Roman emperors ever. He takes power after his father. He does all of the good things to try to build support for his regime in the immediate aftermath of taking power. He's a military hero for the capture of Jerusalem. And then uh, right near the end of his reign, he inaugurates the Colosseum and puts on massive um, spectacles that lots and lots and lots of people enjoy. And then he dies. It's like if you had a huge party uh, and you celebrated, uh, you had a great time, and you never had to pay the bill for it. This is what Titus leaves to the Roman world. Just a, a sort of sugar rush of an imperial reign that ends suddenly um, and ends unexpectedly, with Titus now standing out as one of the most popular Roman figures of all time. Not really for merit, but simply because the rush to build support for a new emperor is the entire story of Titus's reign.